I am Sandra Amer and I'm your Ontario TechSoup Connect host. We are a program of TechSoup and we are a global network of tech for good meetups. And we are a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits to get, implement, and use tech effectively. I'm Sandra Amer. I run All About Systems and I've been working with TechSoup for about uh, just over two years now. I'm passionate about helping nonprofits and small businesses and entrepreneurs use technology more efficiently and empowering them to use technology. So I offer a lot of one-on-one -on -one training. I do digital workplace assessments for smaller organizations and nonprofits to help them better use technology, assess what technology they have and they're using, how they want to use it, what their goals are, and helping them to create a plan uh, that works within their budget to achieve that efficient digital workplace, however it looks for them. I've uh, spent 20 years in IT and project management, so my passion for nonprofits and my passion for technology are a perfect fit here with TechSoup, so I'm excited to be a part of it. I also have been involved in a couple charities as well, including the One Parent Family Association. These are our TechSoup Connect community values. We welcome everybody. We put our community first. We're all here to support each other and help each other succeed at what we're doing in order to build stronger nonprofits. And technology is that uh, main tool that we all use to grow and run our organizations now. So it's a great opportunity to come together and help each other with technology. We love to have participation. So either on our events, feel free to participate through our chats or reach out to me if you have any suggestions for anything or would like to be more involved. And of course, um, like any good nonprofit organization, we treat each other with kindness and respect. If you are interested in helping and helping plan an event, if you'd like to run anything, if you have any ideas, please reach out to me and I'll give you my email later on as well. Or you can reply to the event invites from the Ontario TechSoup chapter. They should come to me. That's a little bit more about TechSoup. It helps to connect your nonprofit with donated and discounted products and mostly products. So there's software, hardware, all of these items that they can connect you with. And a lot of you are probably here because you've already used some of their services. Uh, these are a few of the examples of the services and technology that you can get through TechSoup. And the one missing from here, and I keep forgetting to add it to my slide, is Google Workspace. It's not necessarily something you need to pay for, but it, you do need to validate your Google for Nonprofits account through TechSoup to use it as well. This is just an example of how much you can save with TechSoup. Obviously, a great savings here. TechSoup also has some forums online, so if you are looking for more detailed answers to questions about specific technology, technology related things, database design, et cetera, check out the forums on TechSoup. And finally, what brought you here in the first place is our event page on TechSoup. So our Ontario chapter, you can find, look it up on events.techsoup.org. And these are our upcoming um, events for so far for the next uh, couple months. So today we are here with Omer to talk about funding diversification. And I'm uh, especially excited to hear uh, what you have to share with us about this. I was just having a conversation with Rebecca yesterday and I see you joined us, Rebecca, so I'm glad you're here. And I know she's very excited to hear what you have to say about this and so are lots of people that are on. Let's get to it. And I'm going to hand this over to you, Omer. Thank you very much, Sandra. It's really my pleasure to be here. And I have to admit that I don't have a magical stick that will solve all of the funding problems of nonprofit organizations. But in the last uh, five, almost six years now, we, 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 we started to focus with, we started the research with specific focus on funding diversification for nonprofit organizations. It's obviously a long and demanding journey for nonprofit organizations, but there are lots of things that we can learn from best practices and management side. So today I will summarize what we have learned in the last six years from other nonprofit organizations and from academicians in the at, at uh, different universities. 
So my name is Omer Divarchin. I'm a part-time professor at the University of Ottawa. I'm the founder of the Non-Profit Management Lab at the University of Ottawa. I'm also the founder of uh, Vectors Institute and Vectors Group, two, two businesses, but actually we, we, we prefer to define ourselves as social enterprise. We are not non-profit, but we are very close to non-profit organizations because it's our passion and we do a lot of volunteering work to support non-profit organizations. Let me quickly jump to my presentation. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to interrupt me. I may not see the chat box, but you can, you can just raise your hand and we'll jump in and ask your questions or give feedback. I'd like to use uh, metaphors and one of the metaphors that I use for funding diversification is about, uh, is tires. Okay. So the tire, your funding structure is like the tires in a vehicle. And the first thing that comes to my, to mind is that there must be an alignment. Your tires must be capable to carry your vehicle. So your funding structure must be capable to carry your organization. I will start with a metaphor, but then I will, I, I, I will give you some tangible real life examples that you can immediately utilize in your organization. So <clears throat> let's look at the worst scenario. I, sorry, I'm just going to pause you for a sec. Cause I think you're sharing the presentation mode of the presentation instead of the full slide. Okay. Sorry. So you might want to share the, it'll just be bigger for those of us that might have small screens. <laughs> Can you see the presentation screen? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for warning me. So, oh, well, so this is a monocycle. It looks like fun and many of the nonprofit organizations rely on single funding resource. So although it seems fun, it's too risky. So even if you have 95% government grant, for example, it is not a good thing in the long term because it may not be sustainable and it may be too risky. So even when you have long-term secured funding diversification is something you need to consider. So the second option that comes to mind is using a bicycle. Right, so two funding resources, which is better than relying on single source. But this is also, this may also be risky in certain cases. And if you have a flat diet, for example, then you need to find some additional funding sources. Another scenario is secured small funding. So there, when we talk about funding diversification, the size of the funding is not that critical at the beginning. So try to diversify your funding structure as much as possible. As you see in the picture, small secured funds can be lifesavers in certain times. So as you may have some big funds. In addition, I suggest you to have some smaller funds to, to, to. So some of the funding sources that, that you can categorize are government grants, individual donors, corporate sponsors social enterprise, which is a trending option, crowdfunding, another trending option, fundraising events and, and partnership. And I will briefly touch to some of them. But it's not only the source of the funding, it's also the nature of the funding that matters. Okay. Sometimes if, sometimes you may need some fast funding for shorter periods of times, or sometimes you may survive or you may prefer to have long-term funding. Continuing from the tire example, as you may know, Formula One cars, they need to replace their tires three times in a race because their tires are very good short-term performance. A food bank COVID response funds are good examples of short-term, but it, you may also need to have some long-term funding, like for environment, environment projects, you may need long-term funding. So I want to start with this categorization to have a, have a better understanding about different types of funds. And another one is about the 
duration. Okay, so in, and during the COVID for the last two years, uh, many of the government grants were for short-term impact. They were not looking for three-year or five-year programs. They were looking for three-months programs where, where you can demonstrate a quick impact on the society. So again, the picture tells us, so the airplanes, they frequently need to change their tires because this is the nature of their service where on the trains you have tires that you can use for lifetime. So whatever your nonprofit organization do, this is a horizontal categorization of your funding structure. Okay, what type of funds do you need? You cannot just generalize and long-term funding is the best. There may be some scenarios where long-term funding may not be available and where short-term funds can also respond to your needs. So one key component, and th this is really important, okay, because I work with hundreds of nonprofit organizations. And I had the privilege to work with very big nonprofit organizations like Tim Horton's Children Foundation or Ottawa Food Bank or national nonprofit organizations. But I also work with hundreds of smaller nonprofit organizations and charities, and they all target the same limited resources. But there is one one very impactful option for smaller charities, collaboration. So recently community resource centers and or community health centers or organizations in that role are assigned as a kind of fund distributor in their neighborhoods. They get the funds from the government and they feed smaller charities in their neighborhood. And if you take a look at the grant requirements, almost all of the grants either mandate or encourage collaboration. And this is the secret. We already have one, over 170,000 nonprofit organizations in Canada, and they are all amazing organizations. So what can we do independently? This is a great example. Thanks to TechSoup, we came together, we have an opportunity to discuss our problems, and we may have an opportunity to work together. And working together, collaboration may be the key to, to diversifying your funding structure. So it's not that common in Canada for nonprofit organizations to work together, at least in a systemic or long-term way, but it's a powerful option that you should consider. So you may not have the capacity, but your partner organization may have a big capacity. So most of my examples so far were bicycles, motorcycles, but imagine it's not a bicycle, it's a big bus like United Way, okay? So United Way can carry hundreds of smaller nonprofit organizations and charities, and they already do that. So if you want to secure some funds or diversify your funding structure. If you haven't done so yet, try to get in touch with United Way or other big nonprofit organizations in your area to build long-term collaboration. But it's not only with big organizations. You can also collaborate with smaller organizations at your size. And but when you come together, you can see, you can imagine the impact, right? So with solidarity, you can do lots of things that you cannot do at all. So when, when we talk about collaboration, it's a wide definition and it doesn't have to be an equal share participation or equal share collaboration. It can be just like in the, in the pictures, there may be some big organizations that carry most of the load and uh, there may be smaller charities, but which is okay, right? Because nonprofit organizations they are there to help communities and sometimes they help smaller charities and this way indirectly they contribute to communities as well. So some partnership options, like you can build temporary or permanent partnership. I know amazing partnerships in and gives in kind program, for example, in Ottawa, it's a collaboration, it's a partnership and everyone, over 200 member organizations and they do great, which is a permanent partnership. 
You can also consider cost sharing, okay, or using limited resources jointly in joint projects. So those, those are some of the ideas that, uh, that you can use in terms of collaboration. Now, one of the biggest challenges in funding diversification, we have talked to hundreds of people from nonprofit sector there, and almost all of them complain about the reducing numbers in traditional funding channels, like individual donors, they had more individual donors in the past. And some of them even wrote money in a, in a letter, in, in an envelope and traditional way, making donations with credit cards or some of your, some of your donors visiting your website, making donations to your website, but this is still traditional. Now the new domain is internet and internet. So do you, does your organization have a website and social media accounts? You may say yes. Okay. Because I, as far as I know, almost all of the nonprofits, they have a social media account and they have a website, but imagine the scenario. Okay. So you have a social media account and you have 25 followers. So you already have 10 board members and with their families, you can easily get 25. So having 25 followers means you don't have a social, you don't have a social media account. If your website is visited once a day, you don't have a website. You just have something on the internet that doesn't function as a website. So you need to find ways to operationalize your websites and social media accounts. And I have a very simple equation for this. So whatever number of people you serve, multiply it with 20. Okay. So if you are a food bank that serves 1000 people, then you should have 20,000 followers on your social media. Only then you can say that you have a social media account, but more importantly, then only after then. You can monetize, you can benefit from this new domain opportunity. Okay. So what we learned this, so what are we going to, how can we diversify our funding structure? So I call this five eyes of funding. And I will briefly explain what I mean by this, but they are uh, in a summary that they are inspect identify, invest, insist, and include. And I will briefly explain this, what it means. So the first one is inspect. Okay. So what are the funding opportunities for your organization? What are the grant opportunities? I know some of you don't have, or many of you actually are very busy with operations. You are changing lives. You are helping people. You are busy 24 hours a day. So. I met amazing people in the nonprofit sector. They are fully dedicated to serve communities and they have very limited time to explore some grant opportunities or other funding resources. But this is a must, like the gas in your car or the food on your table. This is a must for nonprofit organizations. If you want to survive, if you want to be sustainable, you have to inspect dedicate some, allocate some time and energy for inspection. And this inspection starts with grant opportunities. What are the grant opportunities for you? What are the trends? Are there any seasonal opportunities or are there any corporate sponsors who might be interested in supporting your cause? And I want to highlight this low hanging apple concept. Okay, so you. You don't need to target Google at the beginning, right? So if you have a small charity, it is less likely for you to have Google as a corporate sponsor, but there are other organizations, other businesses in your neighborhood who might be interested in supporting your cause. And the next one is identify. Okay. So not all funding opportunities are valid or feasible for all non-profit organizations. You need to identify what works best for you. And it's not only about your cause. It's also about your 
capacity. Let's say if you have a huge network, okay, if you, let's say, if you are representing a community or another great organization, Lebanese and Standing, for example, they represent Lebanese communities in Canada. And we have thousands of Lebanese people, successful people in Canada, ready to contribute to that organization. So for that particular case, the feasible option is to find individual donors. But if you are, um, if you are a new startup, nonprofit organization, and if you don't have a wide network, then it is really difficult to find individual donors. So for you, maybe the seed funds or collaboration with bigger organizations or social enterprise may be a better option. So the second component in five, five, five eyes is identify your options. And then the next one is invest. Okay. So there is a big mistake that funding is only about receiving money. Funding diversification is an investment which requires money, right? So without putting money in, without putting energy in, it is less likely for you to get any funds. Of course, there has to be a balance. And I know there is a chicken egg problem without funds. You cannot allocate money for funding, funding diversification, and without this effort, you cannot get funds. So usually most successful organizations, they start with their own capacity, own resources. Sometimes people put money from their own pocket or start with their uh, closed network and find some individual donors. And then when they have the capacity, they continue to invest certain percentage or marketing or capacity building or investment readiness, let's say. So the third one is invest. So we cannot expect extraordinary results without investing and taking risks. And the next one is insisting. Okay. So this is funny because it's not a hundred meter sprint or it's not a marathon. The challenge is you don't know whether it is a marathon or a hundred meter sprint, but you must be prepared as if it's a long-term marathon. Okay. Because sometimes you, if you are lucky, you, re you can rarely get quick results. But usually it's a long-term investment, even for individual donors. They don't make donation decisions right away. They observe you. They observe you sometimes for months, sometimes even for years. And only after then they, they contribute to your cause. So you must be, you must insist in your funding diversification strategy and don't expect to get quick results. You may get quick results, but you shall not rely on this. Okay. So the last one is to include, develop a resilient funding structure and inclusive funding structure. Okay. So you have individual donors, you have corporate sponsors and you have government grants. You need to share the credit. You need to share the beauty or the good that you create. Okay? So get them involved in your programs, promote them, not because you are responsible, not the logos of your corporate sponsors on your website. This is great. And, but this is part of your policy, but you can also invite them to your events, give them a chance to speak. So they will feel part of your cause. Okay. So it's not just giving order. It's also taking something from you. And this is the feeling that you experience. Why do we have non-profit organizations? Why do we have volunteers? Because this is an amazing feeling, helping other people, helping communities. And we should be able to share that feeling with our corporate sponsors and individual donors too. If you have any questions or comments, or if you have any life experience in any of those areas, please feel free to jump in. I'll just say this, that that was excellent and it warmed my heart. 
So I came back on to give you a thumbs up. It's so great, Omer. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Brenda. It's so very really kind of you. Okay, so let me go back to theory side. Okay, now the question is, what are the best practices? So we don't need to invest the wheel again because there are amazing non-profit organizations who pass through that path and they already know what works and what doesn't work. So I try to compile some of the best practices and this is definitely the number one group in low hanging apples. And low hanging apples, if you are a small charity, it can be your uncle, your cousins, your neighbors, if you are a small charity, because to get the ball rolling, you need $1,000 or $2,000 a month. Okay? And so you should be able to collect that money from your close network. But if you are a bigger organization, then instead of your cousins and your uncle and your neighbors, you start with the businesses in your neighborhood. Okay. And you might be surprised how willing they are to contribute to your cause. I know an employer who, who, who owns a startup company and financially he was not in a set of position. But he decided to contribute to one of the biggest nonprofit organizations in, in Ottawa, Shepherds of Crypto. He decided to give 5% of his, of his revenue to Shepherds of Crypto. And so this is amazing. But I was the first person to contact him and connect him to Shepherds of Crypto because nobody knocked his door because many people just assumed that small businesses they don't have financial capacity to help nonprofit organizations, which may be true. They may not have money. They may not have plenty of money, but they always have a good heart that they can even save some budget for the nonprofit organizations. So, of course, it doesn't mean that you shall not knock the doors of big, big employers, big enterprises. You. My point here is start with knocking every door that is closest to your nonprofit organizations. And I will briefly explain how we can make it a win-win situation because you cannot just ask, right? So even if you operate in a philanthropic world, it can still be a win-win scenario. Now the next slide is about individual donors. Okay. So individual donors. Who will donate to your cause? I spent a lot of time to try to understand the psychology of donors. Why do they make donations? And then I noticed I shouldn't go, shouldn't have gone too far. You know, I, start, I decided to ask the same question to myself and I got most of the answers. So when I make a donation decision, why do I do that? And then I noticed that my answers can be generalized because most of the donors make decisions very similar to mine. What is your target group? So I'm a former engineer. I made a donation to it, to an engineering nonprofit organization. Okay. Very few people make, will make donations to an engineering organization. People will prefer food banks, shelters, and other organizations. But my connection there was, I was an engineer, they were engineer. I see the value of engineering. And finally, there is a nonprofit who bridges engineering with the philanthropic world. So this was an amazing cause. Well. So you start with determining the target groups and nothing is random. Okay. So you are doing a professional work. Everything has to be managed and operated in a very professional way. So you collect and manage your data. It's not having names in your head or it's not saving na names in the, in the Excel sheet. You need to do better than that. If you want to leverage this opportunity, you need to be more professional. And then the next one is communication plan. Okay. So what is your message? You should be able to summarize your organization in less than 30 seconds. What do you do? What is your organization? And this has to be studied in advance. What is your message to the people? 
and you try to personalize your relationship. So it's not, I donate to an, any organization. I donate to Kevin's organization because Kevin is nice. His organization is nice. He made me part of his organization. So I love this organization. This is a great organization. You personalize it. And finally, follow up. So donors are like plants. If you don't nurture them, they will die. They will forget you. Okay? Some donors, they need, like plants, they need to be watered every day. Some plants, they can survive without watering for three months. But without exception, every single individual donor needs to be revisited and, and harmed or remembered, let's say. And then the next group is corporate sponsors. Okay, so corporate sponsors is, are quite different than individual donors. So for individual donors, the return is the feeling. Okay, so I make a donation and I feel good. So this is my view. But for corporate sponsors, this is not enough. There has to be some additional value. So what value can be, can be offered to now to corporate sponsors? What do you offer? Anyone who has an idea, what is the value that we can offer to corporate sponsors? The value we can offer is visibility. And this is the only value. Okay? This is the only value that we can offer them. We cannot give them money. We cannot increase. Uh, we cannot give them facilities. We cannot help them to make new business connections but we can give them the visibility that can lead to more customers, that can lead to more business, more revenue. So this way we can create a win-win situation. So this value proposition, what is the value you offer? Okay. And again, we need to do it in a very structured way. We need to manage our individual donors and we need to manage our corporate sponsors. In the business world, there is a common practice, which is called CRM, Customer Relations Management. Okay. So I, I told you we have been working with hundreds of nonprofit organizations. At the beginning, my small brain was enough to keep 20 organizations. But now we are in touch with over 200 nonprofit organizations. So how can I keep track of it? And it's not only me, but how about my team members? How are we going to remember what we have discussed last year? So we decided to use software just like many other businesses. So for businesses, it's a survival tool to use a customer relations management, but also for nonprofit organizations. It's so important to have a structured customer relations management system and use software. And, and I'm sure there are several options that TechSoup provides, but one of the, so one of the uh, most uh, effective software programs is called Salesforce and they offer uh, free services to nonprofit organizations. So if you look at this chart, it starts with environmental analysis. Okay. So this is a circular process and you start with environmental analysis. So who are in my network? Who are in my neighborhood? Which organizations can I contact? And then you develop your communication strategy because depending on the organizations, you determine your message. What do they want to hear? If let's say if sports clubs are your potential corporate sponsors, then you need to create a value that is, that means something for them. And then once you have the communication strategy, the next step is marketing and branding. This is a model uh, our researchers developed specifically for nonprofit organizations. This is not for businesses. These five steps are specifically for, for nonprofits. So marketing and branding, why does it really matter? We are already amazing organizations, right? So people know us. Why do we need to brand ourselves? Why do we need to market ourselves? Because this is how the world functions. If you don't brand, if you don't market yourself, nobody will hear about you. 
nobody will know you. Just like businesses, nonprofit organizations also need to invest time and energy and resources on marketing because uh, otherwise they cannot survive or grow. And then the next step is donations, which needs to be managed and then relationship management. Okay. So I'm sure you all understand what it means because nonprofit organizations are amazing in relationship building, but the management component is something different. Okay. So management is includes conscious administration of the process. It's not only building the relationship, but managing the relationship. This is what nonprofit organizations need to do. So this is a New York based, uh, global organizations, pencils for promise. They use CRM tools. They use Salesforce, but um, I'm not promoting Salesforce. There are several customer relations management tools that you can use, but Salesforce is one of the free ones and uh, it's very popular in the profit sector and pencils of promise made a big impact. They grew very fast after starting using the software or their customer relations management. Another promising, another growing field is social enterprise. And we will talk about digital social enterprise. I know you will, uh, there is another workshop on digital social enterprise, but I want to briefly touch to social enterprise and with specific focus on digital social enterprise, because this is where the money is. Okay. This is where the money is for the private sector. This is where the money is for the nonprofit sector. So when you think social enterprise is basically a business that generates money for your nonprofit organization and charity. Amazing, right? So you don't need to worry about anything. There is a business that generates money for your organization, but it's a different type of organization. You cannot manage a social enterprise as a nonprofit organization. It's a different type of organization, different type of animal. Okay? So it's more like a business. So you need to manage it like a business. And the first questions that comes to mind, is it feasible? What is the business model? Is it profitable? Which sector? Okay, so what should we do? Shall we sell some soap or hand products or shall we open a cafe? So those are traditional and not that profitable. Okay. I'm going to show you one statistics comparing 2018 and 2008, and the numbers are uh, quite similar nowadays. If you look at the top companies in 2008, lots of non-IT companies. But if you look at 2018, all of the, almost all of the top companies are digital. So my point here is if your organization is considering a social enterprise, which you should think about a digital social enterprise, okay? because compared to a physical social enterprise, it has lots of advantages and this is where the money is. So it's, it doesn't, it will not make you money person. Make talking about money will not make you money person, but it will make you a realistic nonprofit leader who is aware that without money, no matter how good your cause is, you cannot survive. I met amazing people, tons of startup nonprofit organizations. And the first question I ask is, where is the money? And if they don't have an answer, a couple of months later, they get exhausted and they gave up. This is really unfortunate because uh, there are some options for nonprofit organizations to gener generate some funding resources. One of the models that I'm not going to go, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to go deep and explain in detail, but Business canvas model, this is one of the most common scientific tools. It's very practical. Uh, it has nine areas. And before you start your nonprofit organization or social enterprise, you try to answer or fill in those areas. So who are your key partners? What are your general revenue streams? 
What are your, what is your cost structure? Those are fundamental questions in business world, but not very common in the nonprofit sector. But by using such tools, it's really easy to implement it in your case. Okay, so digital and social enterprise. How will it look? I'm going to show you two examples. The, one of them is online food bank. Okay, so online food bank is a social enterprise. We started two years ago. And how many food banks we have in Canada? Anyone you can use the chat box. Do you know how many food banks we have? Over 3,000. Okay, over 3,000 food banks. And do you know how many food banks users we have? Over 1 million after the pandemic. This is crazy. And do you know how many of those 3,000 food banks deliver services virtually? This is crazy, right? So everybody's talking about, we were talking about social distancing and safety, health, et cetera, but none of those food banks were offering virtual services. So this was a niche area for a social enterprise because everybody needs such a service. So just to give an ex example, okay? So even in Canada, even in this amazing country, we still have some rule to do better than that. So think about this niche ideas. What can we do differently? How can we generate money? Let me give you an, another example. Okay. So the second digital social enterprise is shop for good. Okay. So it's a platform like Amazon. It's a marketplace, that, but it's a little bit different. All of the vendors in show poor good are people from underrepresented communities. Okay? So when you purchase something that you're helping someone in need. Second, 15% of this revenue goes to Women Multicultural Resource and Counseling Center in Durham. They help women. Okay. So when you purchase something, you not only get the good product, but you also get the good feeling of helping a charity, an amazing charity, and helping someone in need. So this is a social enterprise. It generates revenue for WMRCC. But those are just examples. Okay, so we have over 100 million websites and maybe over a couple of million digital enterprises. And they all make money. So your nonprofit organization can make money too. You just need to, like, this is a really big ocean full of fish. And you just need to have the right tools to leverage from these opportunities. And one, one more thing, the COVID was terrible, right? So we had, we all had terrible experiences and unfortunately many people died, economy suffered, people suffered. But there is a fact, after every global crisis, more opportunities pop up. So most of the millionaires in the history, they become millionaires after crisis. So there are lots of opportunities nobody explored yet. So this is a right time for non-profit organizations to use this filter and look for opportunities. Governments, they want the economy to come back and there are tons of government grants for non-profit organizations. You just need to explore them and make the right decisions. Okay. Another trend you must have heard about crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is uh, basically uh, an, an evolved version of individual donations. Okay. But this time, instead of in-person donations or donations from people you might know, you may get donations from people all around the world. And this is a huge market. Last year, they raised over 20 billion US dollars on crowdfunding, 20 billion US dollars. This is, this is 10 times bigger than the annual revenue of nonprofit organizations in Canada. This is huge. And you can literally, you literally have access to those resources, but you first need to determine 
what channels you need to use to enhance your digital network. You don't now, as an all-profit organization, you don't need to target only your neighborhood. Now, you through this digital channel, you have access to all around the world. You can have donors from Australia, from Turkey, from all around the world. So the first question is, which channel, okay? Which channel shall I use? And it all depends on what you want to do. Okay, this is a very, uh, th this is an outcome of our, one of our research that summarizes which channel works best for which purpose. So if you want to do marketing, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube is the best. If you want to influence society, you need all the channels. If you just want for prestige and YouTube and LinkedIn are ideal. So this can give you some idea. We have to be realistic, right? So we don't need to present in all social media channels unless we can really use them efficiently, right? So if you have an Instagram account and nobody's following, then you should use your resources there. You should find something else. The second one in crowdfunding, okay? So why do people make donations? People make donations because of the stories. So you need stories. We need stories. So there is a close relationship between your funding and your stories. How powerful are your stories? How artistic, let's say, are your stories. It's not only the content of the story, it's also the format, how you present it. So let me give you an example, okay? So Lowry and David Kerr is organizing this event for the, one of their friends who had an accident, who survived the accident, okay? So their friends lost their lives, but he survived. And they were trying to raise $15,000, but they raised $67,070. So every single day, we have hundreds of accidents in Canada, okay? And nobody makes donations to them. But their friends made it so professional. If you look at their, listen, if you read their story, you decide to make a donation. So this is the power of story. And look at his face. He's so nice and you can easily tell he deserves to be supported by so we can easily tell and this is the outcome so their goal was 15 and people kept donating them and one more thing i want you to focus royal bank of canada can you see that seven thousand five hundred dollars so rbc bank made a donation of seventy five hundred to to a student on GoFundMe. Why did they do it? So, yes. I have a question. Yes. So, what if we don't have a tragedy? Oh, it doesn't have to be tragedy. It can be success story. It can be tragedy story. It can be friendship story. It can be anything. Okay. And, and I'm going to show you a video after this slide. And I'm sure all of us shared some videos with our friends, right? So we said, oh, this is a great video. Look at this. Sometimes it is a cat. Sometimes it's a young kid helping his friends or it doesn't matter. But somehow they, men, they succeed in catching our attention. Okay. And, and this attention can be monetized, actually. This is how the system works. So I will come back to your uh, question with... Uh, let, let me share this video first. Okay, this, I watched this uh, video maybe 20 times, and, it, and every, every time I watch it, it, I feel emotional, right? So there is no wording, nothing that, and you can easily connect it to your cause. So let's say you are a youth organization, and then you can say, this is what we do for youth in our neighborhood. This is how we see our brothers and sisters. This is how we treat our communities. So it doesn't have to be your own story, but as far as you can relate to your cause, then it still works. Okay, so we don't know what this organization is, but we can easily relate it. 
I mean, before we, for individual donors, we target hearts or corporate sponsors, we target brains because they say, okay, how many people will visit my website? And if your answer is less than 1000, it is worthless for the corporate sponsor. But for individual donors, what is the story? Why will I feel good if I make a donation to you? Okay, so this is, and if you use this filter um, in on social media, you will see lots of amazing stories, and we can easily benchmark our stories too. So people like kindness, right? So we know that people like kindness. This is a tool that we can use in your stories, and monetization is always through donations. Once they have that feeling. We should provide them the right tools to make a donation in less than a minute, okay? Because our emotions will just disappear after five minutes. We just create this emotion and then make them, help them to make the donation in the following minute. But it's not only that this is an extreme example, and it's this one was sad too, but we can also use success stories. Okay, so I know the nonprofit organization uh, founded by a refugee child and she came to Canada and she had a successful career. She founded a charity to help other girls in the developing countries. And she's a success story. I don't want to disclose her name or the organization now, but, but she was a success story and everybody who hears her story lives in her. Everybody wants to support her because she's an inspiring leader for many girls. Okay. So this basically concludes my, you know, my presentation. Elmer, thank you. That was really insightful. And it was, there was a lot of great information. Thank you everyone for being here and have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.